Welcome. And if anyone is in here from the class of 2016, you just graduated. You don't have to sit through lectures anymore, so go drink. Um, my name is Elizabeth De Stephens. I'm an EMBA from the class of 2015. And I'm very pleased to be here today to introduce Mark, who is going to present to you the sales acceleration formula. Uh, Mark Roberge is the Chief Revenue Officer of Hubs HubSpot Sales Division and a senior lecturer at Harvard Business School. We'll Ooh. forgive you for that. We got a <laughs> At HubSpot, Mark scaled annualized revenue from zero, those of you who are in startup world right now might be at zero, to 100 million in seven years. He was ranked number 19 in Forbes' top 30 social sellers in the world. Mark has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, Forbes Magazine, Boston Globe, TechCrunch, Harvard Business Review, and other major publications for his entrepreneurial ventures. How come you're not in the MIT magazine? That's what I'm yet? asking. I know, exactly. we need to work on that, guys. <laughs> he is also the author exactly. of the best-selling award-winning book, The Sales Acceleration Formula, using data, technology, and inbound selling to go from zero to 100 million. And he's here today to share a glimpse into his formulas for success. And I'm just now meeting Mark, and he actually looks like the fifth Baldwin brother to me, so that might be a <laughs> hidden resume thing nice. that he's not telling us. So please join me in welcoming Mark Robersh. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, great to see some familiar faces and looking forward to dinner and all the events this weekend. Thanks for uh, having me. Um, my speech is very simple. Um, I own all the success to MIT Sloan. The end, any questions, right? <laughs> but uh, it's actually, it's, it's, a, it's humorous, but it's, it's not that far different from that of the story that I take on the road often and, and what I wrote about in the book. Um, as Elizabeth mentioned, I, I sat in class here 10 years ago with a couple of Sloan fellows, Darmesh Shah and, Hub, and uh, Brian Halligan, who had this idea around inbound marketing and HubSpot and jumped on as the fourth employee and first salesperson and uh, seven years later had 450 people under me and had this enormous global sales organization uh, all based on one tech sales class that I took from Howard Anderson, which probably wasn't enough to completely pre prepare me for that journey. Um, but the big kick that folks get out of the story is I'd never worked in sales before. Um, and I, I just had this career of um, being an engineer undergrad, like many of us Sloanies are, started my career as a uh, writing code, and, and then of course coming here to MIT where we have such a quant orientation toward our education and foundation. And it was really that lens of data and science and technology that I applied to scaling a sales team. And I was very blessed and lucky that that particular lens was quite advantageous over the last 10 years due to some major changes that was happening in the, uh, the overall market, how buyer behavior was uh, changing, how the internet has transformed this whole process. So that's what we'll talk about here. The other thing that, you know, the reason for the, the HBS move and, and, and moving more aggressively into academia was at the conclusion of this book, um, I, I wrote that as I've moved into the entrepreneurial ecosystem, I remember at 23 when I entered the ecosystem, I had the naive opinion that the best product wins. And as I looked across the big public companies that were doing IPOs, that was far from the truth. It's, it's becoming a little more of the truth these days with freemium and Dropbox and those types of things, but we all know as British business practitioners that sales and marketing execution is arguably more important and more of a driver to ultimate entrepreneurial success. And what perplexed me about that reflection was we, we don't really teach sales in school. We, you probably never met someone who said, I majored in sales. And we as top MBAs don't really consider it to be a viable career path. So that's kind of been my new mission, hopefully in the next five or 10 years. And I appreciate the invite here to, to just talk a little bit about it and see if we can't change that a little bit and, and alter the, the direction of the entrepreneurial ecosystem. So this is our journey today. Uh, when I took the, the role four years, uh, seven years ago, um, I wrote down these um, four words as a mission statement, predictable, scalable revenue growth. And for the entrepreneurs in the room or future entrepreneurs who are gonna go out and raise money, for whatever reason, if you lead off your venture capital pitch with these four words, they love it. Right? It's just like, oh, this is what I want. You know, this is predictable, I like this guy. Right? But there's not really any meat and potatoes to it. The meat and potatoes were in the four tactics I used behind that. So the first one was, how do I hire the same successful salesperson every single time? Number two, how do I train them in a way that's aligned with today's modern buyer? 
Number three, how do I provide them with the same quality and quantity of leads every month? And number four, how do I hold them accountable to work in those leads with the same sales process? And I figured if I could achieve those four elements, I had a very good chance at achieving my, my mission of predictable, scalable revenue growth. So let's start off with hiring. This will be our, our, our journey here. Um, how many folks have hired salespeople in the room? So just shout out, what, what do you look for in a salesperson? Extrovert. Extrovert. And how do you, how do you assess for that in, during the interview process? What's the name of it? Let's promote it. <laughs> it's called the Enneagram, which okay. I've studied for 30 years, and it shows this automatic program and how they cope in the world. Great, so it's the Enneagram for the videotape here. And uh, is that unique to sales, or is it just a kind of a personality psychology test? But it can show if someone's an extrovert and um, what they're, uh, if they're more likely to achieve, yeah. uh, or if they're more analytical. Great. So likely to achieve extrovert analytical. I personally have used some of the off-the-shelf um, assessments. I do recommend using them. I've used Profiles International, and I've also used Objective Management Group. They hate for me to say this, but um, I've hired enough statistic, uh, enough people to be statistically relevant, and actually ran a regression analysis of their output to whether or not it actually predicted success. And unfortunately, it did not. Um, and they hate when I talk about that. However, um, I still use them because, to your point. It gives you some upfront view as to where to actually look. Question there. Okay, wait. Your person's over there. <laughs> um, what, what else? One more on what you actually look for? Yes, go ahead. So when I hired salespeople, it was more knowledge of the industry. Not necessarily that they've done sales, but they understand how that ah, is. So domain experience. And that was easier, probably easier to uncover, correct? Okay. It's one that I always struggle with. Where should they be on the domain experience versus sales experience dimension? Obviously, here is beautiful, but it's, it's unusual that you can scale an entire sales team here. So which is easier, hiring domain knowledge and teach them your selling model, or, or hiring sales and teach them your domain? And it's, I think it's dependent on the, on the organization. So um, my takeaway is you might all be right. And I learned this in the first year. I think it was my eighth sales hire. I had convinced the number one salesperson from a public company here in Boston back in 2008 to join HubSpot. We were a dozen people in one Broadway right across the street in two rooms um, across here from MIT. And I somehow convinced this number one salesperson out of an 800 person sales team to quit their comfortable job and come and join this high risk startup. Literally the CEO tried to save the person. It kind of hit the press, et cetera. And when they arrived, I rolled out the red carpet. I was just like, this is amazing. We're four or five punks that have never really sold before. This person's just going to teach us how to sell. And I was amazed six months in, they didn't crush it. You know, they didn't do poorly, but they didn't crush it either. And I was just like, how could this be? We hired this number one salesperson, and they come in here, and they're sort of mediocre on our team. And as I reflected on the situation, I realized the context they were coming from couldn't be more different than our context. Their company was literally running Super Bowl ads. It took 30 seconds to explain where you were from and people knew what was coming, and probably about three to five minutes to get to an answer yes or no on whether you had their pain or, or, or their, the, the need for their service. And that couldn't have been more different than HubSpot at the time. You know, our sale at that time was like, we, you know, this is HubSpot, have you heard of us? No, I've never heard of you. Well, what do you do? We do inbound marketing software. Well, what's inbound marketing? Oh, it allows you to build content and attract people to your website you can get, so you can get more leads for your sales team. That sounds awesome. How can I do that? So it was just this long evangelistic sale. And you can imagine that the person with, who would succeed in the public company environment would be very different than the salesperson that would succeed in our evangelistic sale environment. So that was the bad news was the sales hiring formula is different for every company. And I think it's dangerous and irrelevant to be talking to your Sloan alumni peer and, ask, and sharing notes on what you look for in a sales organization, unless your contexts are very similar. However, I do believe that there is a process to engineer your ideal sales hiring formula. And it's not a very hard process. I literally wrote down the 10 criteria after that moment and that reflection of what I thought would correlate with success in our environment. And I defined what each criteria was, what a score of a 1, a 3, a 5, a 7, a 10 would be. And I was disciplined around scoring every single person, every candidate, 
against that criteria. And it was very interesting six months in to have four or five hires and to be able to go back on those interview uh, reflections and see you know, what was correlating with success and what wasn't and what was I missing here. And it wasn't long before I could totally geek out and hire a PhD from here to do a regression analysis against that, uh, that, that hiring profile. And so this was the results of the first uh, regression analysis. Anyone know why I lost that? That was just the, juice, the juicy part. Can I help you out? Did I, okay, cool. Did I do something? Sorry. Okay. So what was, obviously, um, the, the, the longer blue line to the right is a strong correlation, and the lines going to the left are negatively correlated with success. This was not the end result. I will tell you the end result for HubSpot, um, but this was our first analysis. And what was really cool for me was, at this time, Start people, the industry was starting to chirp about how we as buyers were more empowered and we weren't going to put up with salespeople anymore. And we were demanding a different type of salesperson. And this was the first statistical evidence that that might be happening. Because when we think about describing a generic like car salesperson, we might think about closing ability, convincing, objecting, objective handling. And these attributes, at least at HubSpot, were negatively correlated with success. And when we describe a great consultant, a great trusted advisor, we might think about preparation and domain experience and intelligence. And those were the most positively correlated with success. So this gave me a really great guide as to the type of people that I should be going after and how I should have changed my assessment approach based on these results. Right? So there were five that actually correlated most strongly at HubSpot. All three of these were in the top five. My survey to you guys is which one do you think was number one? So how many think? that intelligence was the number one correlator to success within our sales environment. Right? There are a couple people who are shy as they look around and no one else raises their hands. How many people think it was coachability? We got 40% uh, in the room. How about you think it's curiosity? Maybe slightly more. Curiosity is always the number one choice, but it was the number two for us, and it was coachability that was number one. And what's funny about this was I didn't even have coachability in my initial 10 criteria that I thought was going to uh, correlate to success. It took a couple years of me watching phenomenal salespeople that matched all the other criteria fizzle out of the organization. And the pattern that I saw was they arrived at the company and say, Mark, thank you for the 30 days of training and great coaching, but I don't need it. I'll be at my desk. I know how to sell. And it was those folks that, for whatever reason, fizzled out of our organization. So these were our five. Um, and uh, I do find, remember the asterisk that this was our context, not necessarily yours. I do find for the startups that I advise that this, these five tend to correlate pretty strongly. So I'm going to move on to training. Before that, one or two questions. I'd love one or two questions from the audience on sales hiring. Uh, how did you go about ranking I mean, like, the people that ranking process and how did you assess them on their coachability, yep. on their intelligence? Literally two or three people. And for the companies that I, obviously you can't do any statistical relevance at that point, but um, I think it's really critical if you want to build a break or build organization to start developing this muscle group early. Um, and even if you're going to make four hires in the year, at least you've got the, the, you know, the, tra the, the paper trail to be able to learn from your experience. And you're building essentially the foundation for future hiring managers to follow, right? So hopefully you're successful in a couple of years from now, you'll be hiring 15 salespeople in a quarter. Having this type of analysis behind you is quite comforting that you're going to get most of those right. One more question on hiring. Go ahead. What was your sales pitch to them? 12 to 4 or 15? Yes. Yeah, he, you know, this is um, something that I think a lot of entrepreneurs fail to recognize is how hot of a commodity you have. You know, I mean, the people in Oracle that are 24, 25 years old crushing it constantly hear from their manager that they have to wait five years before they move to the next step. And maybe they have to move to Nebraska to achieve that step. And they hear about their buddies who are not as good as them taking the stock in these hot companies and making a lot of money. So you have a really hot commodity of these folks who are running through they're, they're really good at sales, and they've been through great training at these large organizations, and the large organizations can just not deliver on the career path and growth that they'd like. So that was really it, is are we the next Google? And, and, and a lot of them are intrigued by that. Okay. So let me, I'll, I'll take one more. Go ahead. Can you talk about 
responsibility? How do you define it? How do you check for it? Sure. How do you deliver it? Yeah, so um, really my end-to-end -end interview is, I'll, I'll just take you 90 seconds through it. The interview starts for me in the hallway when I meet the candidate, you know, whether or not they, they recognize me and, and ask me about the flag football game that I coached this weekend and how that went and show some curiosity or are they completely like dry and like standoffish. That, that's not a turnoff, but it's certainly an opportunity for them to, um, you know, prove me some curiosity. I warm them up when we get into the meeting around, um, you know, why do you want to come to HubSpot? Um, forget about HubSpot for a second. Where are you going to be in the next five years? I'm clearly doing something here. Sorry. I don't know which button it is. Maybe you can help me. Thanks. Thanks, Ken. All right. Um, so uh, <laughs> the ma he didn't even do anything. He just like he went like this with his fingers. Did you see that? Um, <laughs> so then, um, where are you going? Where do you want to be in five years? Just so I can model that. Then I go into prior success, which is you're at Oracle. You're an account executive. How many account executives are there? They're 278. Great. Where'd you rank? 15. That's impressive. What's that based on? So it gives me a little bit of a. Then, then I do a role play, and I'll say, okay. I'm the VP of marketing at a security software company. Um, you're a HubSpot salesperson. Um, I came to the website last night and requested a demo. It's your lead. Go. And we role play it. And I watch them carefully. Do they spend the next five minutes basically telling me everything I could have learned on the website, which in the industry we call show up and throw up and adds no value? Or do they like spend time asking questions about why I requested a demo and what my goals are and how I came up with those goals and what my plan is to achieve those goals and really show some genuine curiosity. Then I stop the role play. This is the answer to your question. And I test coachability. I first say, have them self-assess. So great, how did you do? And if they're like, I was awesome, that's a turnoff to me, right? But if they're really self-reflective and they're like, you know, I thought I did pretty well here, but I could have improved here. I like that self-reflection and awareness, and then I start coaching them. And I'll tell them, you know, in every interview, I give one piece of, of positive feedback and one piece of negative feedback, because I don't want them to feel like they're bombing. And with the negative feedback, I get up and coach them. Usually it's on deeper discovery questions, and I see how they're responding to that coaching. Are they taking notes, asking good following questions, or are they like glazed over? And then I have them redo the role play. Right, so now everyone messes that second part up. It's a very stressful situation, but the effort counts. And if they actually make progress, they have to really screw up the rest of the interview for me not to hire them. Because if I coached them for 15 minutes and made progress, what's it going to be af like after a day, a week, a month? I mean, we're going to have fun together, right? So that's essentially how I assess. All right, so let's move on to training. It's about training to be aligned with the modern buyer. So if I gave everyone in the room a red pen and said, circle the salesperson, who would they circle? The good-looking, money-hungry individual or the young, helpful lady? Who would they circle? The sleazy cigar smoker or the intelligent thought leader? Who would they circle? The devil or the doctor? Right? So, you know, we laugh, but sometime, 100 years ago, we created this field called sales, which was intended to go out of our office and represent our companies in the market with our prospective buyers. And when I do a Google search for a salesperson today, all three of these photos show up on the first page, and none of these photos show up. That is ridiculous. And my question to you is, is this the era that it changes? Do we as buyers have enough empowerment today because of the internet that we've just had it. And we're not gonna deal with the sleazy tricks, and we're not gonna deal with the cold calls, and we're not gonna deal with the manipulation. Because if that happens, we're just gonna tweet about it, and they'll be cooked, right? So I've, you know, kind of, we've packaged this up to be called inbound selling to really provoke this new way of selling to be more aligned with today's modern buyer. And um, there's two sort of dimensions to it. Um, the first one is, when you think about how to sell, Start with the lens of your buyer and how they perceive purchasing your product. Literally document it. Put it in a Google Doc or a PowerPoint or whatever. I like to use uh, awareness, consideration, and decision. Like, how do they become aware of the pains that you solve? How do they decide to prioritize looking into it? What are the different categories that they consider? And what is your unique differentiation as a category? And then if they choose your category, what vendors do they consider? What evaluation criteria do they use? 
who's involved in the decision, what are all their unique lenses. Start there. This is kind of what we we're talking about, Emily, on how to actually sell. I really like to start from like um, the lens of that buyer. And then I layer on top of that a sales process, right? Um, and then the, the second part is just personalizing every step of the way to that buyer. If we're executing well, we never use the same sales pitch. Every sales pitch is different and it's unique to their problems and the words that they use to describe those problems. Right? Okay, the um, two things to actually um, tactically speaking in the training world that you can execute on and think about as you're training your salespeople is number one, do your best to put your salespeople in the shoes of your buyer. They'll be able to accomplish this inbound modern selling better if they can really relate to the buyer's shoes. So I'll give an example in HubSpot's world. Every single one of our salespeople in the first month spend about two thirds of that month developing their own website and blog on the HubSpot software. They write a bunch of blog articles, they rank in Google for dozens of words, they do a bunch of tweets and Facebook posts, so they, they develop a big social media following for this made up business that they create. They develop landing pages and do A-B tests. They devise email campaigns and lead nurturing campaigns. They do all of inbound marketing on the HubSpot platform before they're on the phone with a, with a marketer. And through that process, because they're doing it through the best in class process that we've developed, they can usually school most marketers and business owners on the concepts of SEO and inbound marketing and email marketing when they finally talk to them. And it's that level of in depth of knowledge and, and, and connection with that buyer that helps them pull this particular aspect off. Right? All right, so let me move on to um, the quality and quantity of leads. So how many people in the last six months have received a cold call at the office and you got into an engaging conversation with that telemarketer and you ended up buying their product? Usually there's one or two. Okay, someone called me recently and said, do you have a crack in your windshield? And I said, no, and they hung up the phone. I was like, <laughs> that's what their job is to do, okay? How many people in the last six months have received a piece of direct mail or an unsolicited email to your inbox and you opened it, you were intrigued, and you ended up buying that product? What was it, remember? We had about one, you know, 4%. 70%. Ah, cool. So B2B analytic, cool, awesome. How many people in the last six months have had a problem and gone online to Google to research that problem or to social media to research that product? And uh, that led to a purchase through that research. Okay, so now we're up to like 80, 75, 80%. So interesting survey 10 years ago when I used to run it and the results were the same. Probably a little less, probably pretty intuitive these days as we as buyers are highly empowered by the internet. But if we rethink that survey and ask ourselves as business leaders, where are we spending our sales and marketing dollars? How much are we spending on cold calling? How much are we spending on advertising? How much are we spending on unsolicited email, like list purchases, versus building content to rank in Google and attract people to us? There's still a pretty big imbalance. So as executives, we can appreciate that natural tendency we have of slowness to change and take advantage of this to gain a competitive advantage. I think most people get this. And folks come up to me after these speeches and say, Mark, it was great. I'm the CEO of this company and I'm gonna start blogging once a week. And I'll tell them, no you won't. Like, I thought that was the whole point. Like, yeah, but you're CEO of a, what are you working, 60, 70 hours a week? And now you're gonna add on blogging once a week or once a month. You might do it for a few weeks, but eventually a fire is gonna happen, you're gonna stop. So for whatever reason, we just don't think about building the muscle group around content development, right? So. The, um, the, the, the folks, the, the, what we have to realize is the power of journalism in the future of marketing. I really believe that journalists hold the keys to the future of sales and marketing. And good news for us, bad news for them, is their industries are not doing well. Remember doing the Boston.com case, in uh, the Boston Globe case in school 10 years ago? I mean, the newspaper and magazine industries are not on fire. And what we have as a resource uh, environment is a whole bunch of extraordinarily gifted people that don't know how to redefine their careers. And we as executives can rethink this. The second hire we made at HubSpot in our marketing team, when again we had a dozen people in a room, was a reporter for the New York Times. That was the second hire on our marketing team. Right? So 
We, this is the journey that we have, is to find this journalist. Now, they don't have to have a lot of domain experience. That's our jobs as the thought leaders, as the C-suite, as the salespeople, as the engineers. That's our job. We can form a thought leadership committee at our company to really own the space. A great journalist can sit down with a PhD in nanotechnology, knowing nothing about nanotechnology, and interview them for an hour and write a beautiful piece that everyday people can understand. That's the skill we're trying to hire. And we surround him with that thought leadership committee, and every Monday at 9 a.m., the journalist sits down with one person from the dozen or so people that are thought leaders at your company and does an hour interview on a niche subject, ideally a question that your buyers have early in their journey, uh, and, and does the hour interview. From the hour interview, they can write a three to five page, five page ebook. They can write um, a few, you know, a couple of blog posts from that one interview. They can schedule a few dozen social media messages uh, over the course of the month. And each one of those messages points back to the relevant blog article. And most importantly, at the bottom of each blog article, it says, did you like this article on XYZ? Perhaps you'll like the five page ebook we wrote. And people click through on that ad and they say, good news, the ebook is free, I just need your name, phone number, and email address, and it's yours. Right, so that simple process that was an hour of my time as an executive, maybe once a month or once every six weeks, created a whole bunch of uh, traffic to my website, nice Google ranks, a blog subscriber base, a social media subscriber base, and a really high conversion from visit to lead on our website to feed our sales team. Okay? All right, so um, the other hot topic in this area is the sales and marketing alignment that's happening today. And as I've gone out, there we go, you wanna wiggle your fingers? Okay. <laughs> as, we, um, as, as I've gone out and worked with, I don't know, hundreds of these organizations before, um, I find a very consistent pattern between sellers and marketers, and that is that they don't get along, right? <laughs> Usually, um, the marketers feel that the salespeople are overpaid, spoiled brats, and the salespeople feel that marketers do arts and crafts all day. And they essentially revert back to their respective corners and they do their trade show booths and branding exercises and they do their cold calls and that's what sales and marketing is. And that was fine a decade or two ago. But in this day and age where, where the front half of the buying journey typically starts in the domain of marketing but ends in the domain of sales, this can be the death of a company. And for those that can get this interchange right can be a great competitive advantage. So I had a great partner in this, also another Sloan named Mike Volpe, who was our CMO. And we sat back and said, we've really got to nail this, this partnership together. And of course, as Sloan is, we tried to quantify this. So we created this SLA, which the IT folks here will know as service level agreement, which was a really well-structured agreement of like how many leads and what kind of leads Mike would deliver to my team every single month. And we knew that if I had a mid-market rep and I gave them 100 leads, that on average, they would connect with half of them, create 30 sales opportunities, do 15 demos, and close five customers for about $800 of monthly recurring revenue per customer, like clockwork. So it was very easy that if I had 10 mid-market reps, then, and they each of them need 100 leads, we need 1,000 mid-market leads every month. Now that was pretty good, and that, of the companies I work with, that's, you know, top, top 10% in terms of folks who roll out sales and marketing alignment and, and SLAs. However, it still wasn't quite perfect for us because what we found in that structure was when our marketing team delivered a mid-market VP of marketing that came and requested a demo, we obviously counted that as a sales ready lead. Now when they also had a VP of marketing come and download an ebook, we also counted that as a sales ready lead, and they both should be counted. Those are great leads, a VP of marketing coming to our website, either download an ebook or requesting a demo. Now, which one do you think closed to a customer at a higher rate for the sales team? The person that requested the demo or the person that downloaded the ebook? It was the demo request by about three times. Now, which do you think was easier for the marketing team to convert a visitor to fill out a form, to get them to fill out a form to download an ebook or to get them to fill out a form to request a demo? ebook. So natural misalignment there. And sure enough, as the month progressed and the marketing team fell behind in their SLA, all the calls to actions on the website changed from demo requests to ebook downloads so they could catch up. And naturally, the lead quality came down and the reps were like, where's the, where's the demo requests? So Mike and I sat back on that and thought about it. And what we essentially did was we analyzed a whole bunch of historic lead flow. 
And some of that lead flow was at the problem education stage, the white paper, the ebook downloads. And those leads converted at 2% to a customer. And when they bought, they bought $200,000 worth of software. And we had the demo requests, who were at the solution research stage, three times the conversion rate. 6% they would convert to a customer, also bought $200,000 of software when they, when they purchased. So I multiply the conversion rate times the revenue, and I've engineered a lead value. The ebook downloads are worth $4,000 to us, and the demo requests are worth $12,000. Now I'm in a position to say to Mike, I don't need 1,000 mid-market leads a month. I need $500,000 of lead value. And I can now put marketing on a revenue quota, just like sales. And that's a bit of an interesting concept when you think about that. Now, whether Mike gets there through whatever the math is, you know, 100 um, uh, white paper downloads or, you know, 33 demo requests, it doesn't matter to me. I'm still going to hit my number. Okay. Now, it's not just a one-way relationship. If marketing is going to be that precise and accountable in their job, we have to be equally accountable in sales. So I would ask myself questions on the sales side, like, I know when I give a lead to a sales rep, they need to call it within seconds or minutes. There's tons of research that shows that you're exponentially, going to be exponentially more successful if you call it within a very short period of time. That's easy. But if I do call them and get voicemail, how long should I wait until I call them again? Should I call them again this afternoon or tomorrow? Should I call them next week? How many leads should I give a salesperson every single month? Should I give them one lead a month and have them call that lead a thousand times? Or should I give them a thousand leads a month and have them call each lead once? Like obviously neither of those is right, but like where in the middle is the optimal answer? So I did a bunch of studies, and here's one that I did that studied the ideal number of attempts we should make against each lead. And obviously if you call lead more often, your likelihood of getting on the phone is higher, but it costs you more to pursue that one account. Right, so the why shows the profitability, the estimated profitability on that behavior. Some of these leads were only called twice. Some of them were called 15 times. And obviously, we want to max out each line. So for the small business leads, the ideal number of calls was five attempts. Mid-market was eight. Enterprise was 12. And now I could say to the sales team, folks, we just calculated the ideal behavior to make the most money at this company. And that's what salespeople want to hear. Right? And we programmed it into the CRM, so you don't have to think about it. You just mark that you call them, and the lead will go away and come back when it's ready to call. And we're going to produce daily charts that go out every night that shows to make sure that we're following that behavior. And now, every single night, a chart that displayed the sales SLA as well as the marketing SLA went out. So this is the example on the marketing SLA. This was our journey in September from 0 to 100% of that, that $500,000 of lead value. And the blue line shows where marketing was every single day. And as you grow a large organization, this has to be hugging that red line pretty precisely. Because if Mike's team had a huge blowout week to start and then flatline, I just don't have the salespeople to call all those leads at once. But if he has a terrible three weeks and then explodes at the end, my guys are twiddling their thumbs for three weeks. right? So you now have an opportunity to measure arguably the most important lifeblood of your organization, your sales and marketing funnel, on a daily basis. Okay? All right, so um, last question, and maybe you guys have one or two questions. The last section is, um, uh, how do we hold folks accountable to working those leads? We've done the hiring, we've done the training, we've done the demand generation in a modern way. And so um, this is really where the sales manager comes into play. And I wish I could rename sales managers to be sales coaches, because that is really the most important thing they do, in my opinion, is driving frontline productivity with great coaching. And I often make an analogy to learning the game of golf, which I've tried for 15 years without, without much success. And I've taken a bunch of lessons. And one golf pro said, Mark, take a swing. And I did. And he said, OK, try turning your grip over a little bit. Lean back in your stance more. Put more weight in your right foot, not your left. Think 1 o'clock, not 2 o'clock in your backswing. And give me more wrist on contact. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. right?" Another golf pro said, Mark, take a swing, and I did. And he said, try this grip. Now take 100 swings, and I did. 20 minutes later, he's like, how's that feel? I'm like, you know, that feels a little bit better. He's like, now take, lean back in your stance more. Take another 100 swings, and I did. He's like, how's that feel? That feels good, right? And it's a very simple example, but I've promoted like 18 reps to manager 
and every single one takes the coaching approach of the first golf co coach. They, they see like the 50 things that are broken with the salesperson and they throw up on them for an hour with feedback about what they should do. And you can just see the salesperson's head spinning, like nothing's getting done. So the better managers, the better coaches, see the 50 things, but they know the one or two that are appropriate as the next step and the main blocker for their performance. And they use the metrics to diagnose that. I call that metrics-driven sales coaching. Right, so here's an example. This is a funnel where you've got a bunch of leads created, a leads worked, demos delivered, and revenue closed. And each color is a different salesperson on the team in a given month. And let's say we were the sales manager, the sales coach for the person at the top in the purple. If we didn't have the numbers, I will guarantee you that 99% of managers would say, Fred is not succeeding because it's an activity problem. He needs to do more calls. That's what managers always like to say. But now that we have the numbers, that is so wrong. He's doing tons of calls. He leads the team in calls almost. The problem is that he's making these calls and nothing's getting into the demo stage. He's the worst at the company in converting to demos and the second worst at converting those demos to revenue. So now I have a viewpoint as where I need to coach this person. In fact, I can learn more from the numbers. I know he's broken here, which is a function of him calling people and getting them on the phone or getting them on the phone and getting them to accept the next step of the demo. And I need to know the answer because my coaching is way different. If he's struggling here, he's calling a bunch of people and not getting them on the phone, I have to look at the quality of his emails, his voicemails, the frequency, the depth. If he's doing great here, but not here, that other coaching is irrelevant. What we need to listen to is how he's breaking ice and building trust. Right? So this is an example of how you can dig in to the numbers and really manage a sales team uh, through this particular uh, strategy. Right? So, I'll leave you with this, as um, Elizabeth mentioned, I wrote a book on this process, it's a bestseller on Amazon. More importantly, all the proceeds go to a nonprofit called build.org. Anybody involved or have heard of build.org? They're in about six to 10 cities, I think, across the country. I'm actually going to do their uh, con judging a contest tomorrow. What they've done is they've combined entrepreneurship with inner city kids who just haven't had the, you know, probably the background that most of us have. They're probably high school kids that'll end up in games or on the street, and in freshman year of high school, they introduce entrepreneurship to them. And they all go through a four-year program of building their own company, and by senior year, they're selling product. These are the worst high schools in the country, and the kids that go through this program graduate high school at 99%, which I guarantee you is way above the, the high school average, and I think 80% of them end up in college. Um, so uh, you can check out that organization. They're expanding across the country. All right, um, any final questions? We're a couple minutes early. If there's two, one or two questions, I'd love to take them. Building sales. Go ahead. All these data analytics, do you have a, a sort of system that um, uh, is there for organizations to kind of you know, uh, produce that data and monitor it? Yeah, I'll slip you the 20 bucks after. We, uh, we've built a free CRM at HubSpot. <laughs> so that's, that's what we use, is we use that for our sales and marketing journey. But there are other systems, there's CRMs out there, Salesforce, Pipedrive, et cetera. And there's a, an exploding category around sales acceleration tools like um, Tout or SalesLoft, and we, HubSpot, are in that, that, uh, uh, that book as well. I mean, to be honest, we try to be everything in, to SMB, and there's uh, some great you know, different um, niche products uh, for more of the enterprise. One more question? Go ahead. What your company does. Sure, so uh, the, we, uh, the company was founded on that inbound marketing premise that I mentioned as step three, which is a future of demand generation. Um, Dharmesh Shah, one of our co-founders, actually did a thesis here at MIT around how the internet will change buying behavior. And this was 10 years ago, a lot, you know, very intuitive to us today, but what he found was uh, we as consumers are no longer um, not only are we no longer receptive to traditional advertising, we have tools that block it out, whether it's the do not call list or spam blockers, and all organizations, their future from a demand gen standpoint needs to be around blogging, social media, building landing pages, doing e email nurturing campaigns. For a small business owner, that's extremely challenging. And so we assembled this, the software to be able to power that, and now have moved into the sales software as well. Any other question that might not be as a much of a corporate pitch for me? One more educational one. Okay, I'll probably see many of you at drinks and dinner. Thank you for the time.